Uh, can we have a roll call? Smith? Johnson? Be present. Julia? Here. Jackson? Here. Loops? Here. Nelson? Here. Hoffman? Present. Smith is absent with notice. McGillivray? Here. Mr. Chair, you have a quorum. If you could all rise for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Just to let you know, on the next day, on the approval of the agenda, things got changed around a little bit. Parks wanted to try to move up because they've got some other commitments. So, um, so we're going to take uh, the, the three parks items first. Um, with that, um, do I have a motion to approve the minutes from May 2nd, 2023? Moved by Joliet, supported by Jackson. Uh, is there any further discussions or corrections to the minutes? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Like sign for those opposed. Motion carries. <coughs> Next is uh, uh, the approval of the agenda. <coughs> is there a motion? Moved by Hoffman, supported by Nelson. Uh, any, any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Like sign for those opposed, motion carries. Uh, next item is public comment. Is there anyone in the audience that would like to address items that, uh, that are on the agenda? Seeing none, we'll move on. Uh, next we have, uh, there's no communications. Uh, can, uh, there is no consent agenda, right? Or is that? No, there, yeah, okay. we just have it. All right. Right. Okay, under the regular agenda, number nine, the first item is A, Parks and Recreation Grant Agreement with the City of Pontiac for the Crystal Lake Park uh, Revitalization Project. Is there a motion? Moved by Lou, supported by Nelson. Uh, see, come on now. <laughs> You're in the line of fire. And I'll turn it over to Mr. Ward. All right. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I'd like to introduce, if you don't all know, Califani Stevens, Deputy Mayor of the City of Pontiac. Good morning. Alex Borngesser. And I'm sorry, Alex, what you're talking about? Uh, Director of Grants and Philanthropy. Okay. She's the one who makes the magic happen. That's yes, she is. <laughs> <laughs> we really, really enjoyed over the last uh, year or so getting to know both of these individuals well as we've worked with the city at Pontiac, um, both on the plans that are before you today and many other items where I think we're partnering very well, working together for the betterment of recreation opportunities for people in the city. Um, so the first item here, uh, in, and I believe the second item, relate to the commission's approval last October of the American Rescue Plan Act, Healthy Communities Park Improvement Plan. Uh, you appropriated $15 million. Uh, Oakland County Parks and Recreation Commission committed $5 million plus uh, in matching funds. And uh, a large piece of this uh, our agreements uh, with several of these local communities to transition the management of um, municipal existing parks that need a little bit of revitalization and, and financial support. And another piece of that as well are grants to uh, five local communities that were disproportionately impacted uh, during the pandemic and, um, and for the purpose of supporting their park improvement uh, needs. We have before you today the portion of the plan that uh, is dedicated to the city of Pontiac. We work very hard with the city to work out the agreements um, for both. There's a grant agreement on a, using our template for the rescue plan um, for many other grants. Uh, and the purpose here is to provide up to $500,000 to the city for their Crystal Lake uh, revitalization <coughs> project. And I'll turn it over, if it's okay, to, to Alex to give you a short presentation on sure. how those funds will be used. And the city is really excited and grateful to have the opportunity to enter into this interlocal agreement for re revitalization of Crystal Lake Park. 
Um, the city sees um, a new vision for a vibrant and sustainable park system in Pontiac. As you know, we have roughly 36 parks, including recreation centers and linear parks. Um, this is a, a part of the mayor's plan to implement ARPA dollars to revitalize all of those parks, including the linear parks, and Crystal Lake is one of those. Understanding that Pontiac is comprised of roughly 61,000 residents, has a primarily black and African American community, um, is comprised of 19.1% of residents identifying as Hispanic and Latinx. Over 27% of our residents live in poverty and approximately 11% of our population is 65 years of age or older. Um, because of all of these items, it is clear that the pandemic has not affected all of Americans equally, and the most vulnerable among us are feeling the effects of the pandemic most intensely. And so we're taking um, this opportunity to revitalize our outdoor spaces, to invest in health and wellness, um, understanding that parks play a role in economic development and neighborhood revitalization. And because of that, we've chosen many of our community parks, our neighborhood parks, and our mini parks to invest in with our dollars. The quality of our green spaces um, greatly reduces climate and health risks while also improving the physical and mental well-being and the quality of life for our residents, and that's really our goal. This park in particular is Crystal Lake Park. Um, you can see the property here from an aerial. The accessibility rating, which was determined through our Parks and Recreation Master Planning, is, has an accessibility rating of one, which is pretty poor. Um, it's 42.93 acres, and it's classified as a community park, which is one of our largest parks. Um, this park's identity is passive recreation, leisure, fishing, um, et cetera. And it is currently located in District 1, which is Councilwoman Melanie Rutherford's district. And you can see that area here. The park currently has very little amenities um, and is actually boarded up from the public and doesn't allow for entry. Um, the park has a propensity for beautiful recreation and is um, really an underutilized asset to the city. Right now, you'll see the park entryway located at item one and the pier, which is not usable at um, uh, icon two. The yellow line indicates all of the property that is owned by the city. Um, we do own the full shoreline along along with the adjacent property into the parkland and some of the marsh and swamp area. The Parks and Rec Master Plan was a wonderful opportunity for the city to go out and engage in community engagement and community uh, feedback and participation. And from that, we established um, uh, preferred or recommended changes and upgrades to each of our parks. And here you'll see that list. Our intention is to create a new site plan for the park with waterfront activities, restore and improve the boat launch and lakeside access, um, install historical markers, and open up public access to the park, which currently doesn't exist. Um, installation of new benches and picnic tables, a picnic shelter, a beautiful walking path along the water's edge with uh, mile markers, a, a beautiful natural vegetative buffer along the edge of Crystal Lake to reduce stormwater runoff, and um, educational signage reducing human <coughs> wildlife and things of that nature. You can see here, this is a preliminary plan that was created with the Friends of the Pontiac Parks Association that can show connections to the Clinton River Trail, which is a wonderful asset in Pontiac as well. It's our goal to fill the gap in the donuts, which is Pontiac right now for the Clinton River Trail, and we intend to connect it to the major parks in the ways that are most appropriate. So um, this is a, a quick overview of what that looks like and where the fishing pier would remain on, on the peninsula. And I'm available to answer any questions if, if you have any. Mr. Chair, if I can, uh, under the terms of this agreement, this will uh, remain a city of Pontiac managed and owned and operated park. Um, the grant dollars will go to the city of Pontiac and they will be responsible for you know, administering and managing the, um, the construction project. Um, per all of our ARPA rules, um, the project must be complete by and open for public use by the end of 2026. Yes. Um, and I think committed by the end of next year. So. Because um, Alex said, I think we're happy to answer any questions you might have. Not about this oh, particular park. What's a linear park? 
linear parks are how we refer to our trail systems. Um, it's the easiest way to designate our trails as part of our park system overall. So it includes the North Spur, the Clinton River Trail, and some of the other parkways that are um, running through Pontiac that were formerly um, unused land. Um, we intend to implement some park activity in some of our unused alleyways as well. So um, as we redo our Complete Streets Master Plan and update our Parks Rec Master Plan, it will include those linear pathways. Thank you. And who would patrol this park? The city of Pontiac is staffing up its Parks and Recreation Department to have um, our own version of park rangers or park staff. And so we're hiring, I think, roughly eight um, staff members who will be responsible for maintenance and oversight of the city's parks. Thank you. And the uh, law enforcement, the uh, sheriff's office. The sheriff's office, office as well, yes. Commissioner Joliet and then Jackson. Um, so I know that area quite well. I golf at Crystal Links, which oh. I, it's a beautiful golf course that's kind of a secret, although it's getting out. Um, so I see the boat launch that you guys have planned, and I'm assuming you know of all the balls that go in. <laughs> <laughs> They're so, mostly hurt. Yeah, put your, yeah, put your name yeah. on them. So I don't, I don't know. I'm they sure have KJ guys, on them. You're yeah. getting back. Well, okay. okay. Um, I don't, just a matter of safety. Just on the second, so Crystal Lake is here, and then it because you saw the little jetted island where people drive out to do that hole. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so I mean, that whole edge, balls go flying. Mm. So just something to keep in mind when you do the boat launch. Great. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> mm. Extra layer of excitement. <laughs> yes. Yes, that could be its own game Not in so itself. Passive. <laughs> well, you get a you get a helmet with your paddle boat. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Commissioner <laughs> Jackson. I just want to say Pontiac is where it's at, okay? I've been on the commission since 2009, and the uh, developments and the revitalization and renaissance that Pontiac is, is um, having right now is exciting. You know, as our county seat, um, when I see programs like this and um, revitalization efforts like this, this is the way it should have been a long time ago. But I want to ask today, you mentioned you had 36 parks and um, how many are swimmable places? Swimmable? Yeah. Um, any of them, Hawthorne, any looking to be for kids and people who I swim in boats? I think it's fair to say we, you don't. Is Galloway? So, th so the answer to that question is several of them are on lakes. Mm -hmm. So Galloway is a lake, um, Crystal Lake, um, Kiwanis Park is, is on the lake. It's on Harris Terry. See the Harris or Terry? I can forget which order they come in. Um, the issue, however, is that none of them have beaches created. Mm -hmm. So they may have some natural areas. So I swam in them as a kid, mm -hmm. but that doesn't necessarily mean that they are swimmable. <laughs> so they 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 are. They are safe to swim in, but they're not swimmable in the sense that we have not gone and pulled out all of the natural vegetation to create a swimming area. So gotcha. unsanctioned swimming may occur. <laughs> yeah, uh, exactly. Uh, you know, with the next Waterhole item. Waterhole swimming. Uh, yes. <laughs> with Hawthorne, it's something we definitely want to take a look at there yes. uh, as a potential, but um, early on in the process, obviously, we need to a sense of what the water quality is. Um, e. coli, it's closed a lot of beaches in the county all over the place. So mm -hmm. make sure the conditions are all right, be able to have sanctioned swimming. It would be, be wonderful for us if things move forward with Hawthorne, especially yeah. as uh, the wave pool at Waterford Oaks, uh, we're right. you know, having so many challenges staffing that up and it's aging, that maybe there is an opportunity to transition you know, our, our aquatic uh, recreational opportunities to that that facility. Okay, thank you. That would be exciting. Yeah. Are there any Kristen? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So first and foremost, this land is truly a, a nice hidden gem. Yes. Um, I have tromped around this area for quite some time. It, it actually has some pretty good fishing. Uh, back in the day, we take my nephews and niece. Um, so I'm really excited to see um, what we're doing moving forward with this land because it truly is a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful piece of land. I'm excited to also see that it looks like you're going to have walking paths. Yes. Around, is it going to be around the lake? Yeah, so if you, so there you go. Um, this, all of this area inside of the red, 
historically was the um, city owned um, low income housing um, area that has been um, removed for almost 30 years now. Uh, we are actually in talks with a developer to redevelop all of that as again, multifamily housing, but this time it would actually be um, private housing not um, owned by the government. And so this is the, the main portion of the park. And then you would have a walking, so we own all of the lakeshore. You have a walking trail all the way around and back to here. Mm -hmm. And we are working with the people who own this parcel as well to create um, a connection to what is the Clinton River Trail. Okay, so that actually leads into my last question. I know that um, the Clinton River Trail in that portion had some really great upgrades. Yes. I know now they're using the crushed limestone on the path, which has just helped significantly with a lot of seniors, individuals with disabilities, being able to really utilize um, and have that mobility along the Clinton River Trail. Will you be utilizing the same materials for that walking path throughout um, Crystal Lake? Or don't know yet? So the short answer is I don't know. The okay. long answer is the city of Pontiac is really trying to make a um, philosophical change in the way that we invest in the community. So if that limestone is honestly the, the best material, and when I say, you know, they're when you say best material, there's it's best for a number of different things, right? Sure. Best for water runoff, best for um, being good on your knees, best, you know, for long term, um, long, long longevity uh, before you have to replace it. But what we're really looking to do is to say, hey, what are the materials? What is the investment? What is the standard that we can put in place? that is going to communicate to the community that this is an asset that we care about. And so if the limestone is, is that um, material, that's what we'll use. If it's wood chips, if it's whatever. But again, we have to make sure like all of those different factors are taken into account, especially with it being right at the water for Great point. Home. I'm excited and I look forward to seeing what happens and transpires in the future with this property. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments? Yeah. I want to comment that the mayor is here. <laughs> our, our former fellow commissioner. Love That's mayor. right. Welcome. <laughs> he usually makes me stand when he interviews. <laughs> <laughs> I, I always address. Uh, it seemed awkward. I always address a direct word as Your Eminence. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we do too. <laughs> Well, th thank you, Mr. Chair, for uh, allowing us the opportunity to come in. I'm sorry I'm late. I had a Habitat for Humanity event in uh, Pontiac this morning that uh, ran a little long, but that was a really nice uh, rallying of volunteers in the community. I, I just want to thank the, the Parks Commission and the County Commission for the investment in our community in Pontiac. This is a really exciting opportunity uh, between this and the a partnership agreement that we're taking before council this evening for uh, what was formerly known as Hawthorne Park and what will soon be known as Pontiac Oaks Park. Uh, we're really excited about these partnerships with the county. It makes a huge positive difference and impact in the quality of life in Pontiac. And I know that all of our residents are really excited uh, about this partnership and the investment. Thank you all. Any other comments? Uh, hearing none, can we have a roll call vote, please? Mr. Chair, you have eight yeas, zero nays. Very good, thank you. All right, uh, next item is um, Parks and Recreation and Local Partnership Agreement with the City of Pontiac for Hawthorne Park. Uh, is there a motion? Moved by Hoffman, supported by Nelson. Uh, <laughs> Chris? So, hey, all right, thanks again, Mr. Chair. So this is the second piece of the implementation of our Healthy Communities Plan for the City of Pontiac. Uh, really an extraordinary opportunity for Oakland County Parks uh, with this partnership agreement, and it truly is a partnership agreement. I want to commend the mayor, who's a little bit kind of a tough negotiator, uh, and uh, thank the chairman, uh, both Chairman McGilvery and Chairman Woodward. I had to call in the big guns to uh, finalize our, our negotiations two weeks ago. 
Um, a lot of work getting us to this point. We've got a lot of work ahead. What this agreement does is provide for the transition of the management, operation, maintenance responsibilities uh, for Hawthorne Park, a 77 acre park just up the road here on Telegraph Road, um, to Oakland County Parks under guidance and ongoing collaboration direction from city government uh, along the way. So uh, it's a 20 year agreement with an option to renew. Um, so, you know, one of the things I think that's wonderful about this is this one time federal money has provided opportunities to do things we ordinarily couldn't do. And in this case, we're going to see the benefits of that for generations to come. Uh, Hawthorne is a beautiful park, and we're just fairly excited to roll up our sleeves uh, and get to work. Uh, and the mayor has set, as always, an ambitious agenda for us there. We'll start uh, with mowing the grass in July, and, and we've already been over there uh, working with the city on cleanup projects. Uh, and um, as I said, it's a, we're very excited about it. I want to introduce... Uh, I think many of you met Zach Zukowitz, who is our DEI coordinator, and Jess Watley, who works on our uh, planning team and is taking point on this project. Um, Mayor, did you want to say anything? Well, again, I, j I just want to thank the, the county, the Parks Commission, the county commissioners themselves for the the investment in Pontiac and for the partnership. Um, you know, there, there was some give and take in, in figuring out some of the details and specifics here, but I think it's really a win-win for both entities. And we're thrilled to, to have this opportunity to work hand in hand with the county to improve the quality of life for all of Oakland County's residents, including those in the city of Pontiac. So thank you all for the consideration and thank you, uh, Director Ward and the Parks Commission for approving uh, the agreement already. The eminent stuff stops when he's negotiating. Or <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody have any questions? Penny? There's no charge for entry into this park, but notes that you may establish park fees and charges at the park. What would be an example of a fee or charge? So um, there is a pavilion there, uh, and we may be considering adding additional pavilions. So. A rental for a private event. If there are, um, you know, specific recreational programs, maybe like yoga in the park or something like that, special activities. But the general uh, entry to the park will always be free um, for both city residents and Oakland County residents. Thank you. So um, I think this is fantastic. Uh, just give me an example of the collaboration. Since we're maintaining the park, when do you go to the council? Uh, well, it starts with developing an action plan, basically a master plan for the park and the capital improvement plan for the park, which um, the city council must approve. Uh, so no major uh, investment fixed assets there above $30,000 can't. They can occur without their approval. We will be submitting a um, operations plan, a security plan for the park, um, uh, and it's going to be ongoing discussions back and forth. Uh, well, that's good. So yeah. everything we do, we will be doing together. They we will be, be doing together, and, and really nothing major will occur at this park without their uh, input. Sounds good. Yeah. Thanks. Kristen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Again, another slice of heaven hidden right here in Oakland County. Um, the one thing I love about this park is it has a disc golf course. Um, <laughs> as we move forward, are we keeping the disc golf course? And is it an eight or an 18 hole is disc golf course? 18 hole right now. It is. Uh, the disc golf course um, is basically, I believe, an informal agreement between the city and an association. Um, so, you know, there may be some adjustments uh, that need to occur as we bring that into our management. Um, there is a bit of an issue with sort of competing use there a bit. We want to make sure as we're opening up this park for more recreational uses that I mean, there's some just safety issues with disc golf that you need to have. <laughs> you, know, you need to, when we're looking at the helmets for the pistol leg, <laughs> we may need helmets to sit at a picnic bench uh, you know, at uh, Hawthorne Park. But yes, the, the short answer to your question is we intend on maintaining disc golf there in some form or fashion um, with possibly some you know, adjustments. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, hi, everyone. This is a very exciting thing. Um, so I've just been like furiously on Google Maps um, this whole time looking at the beautiful park. Um, it's bifurcated by a very busy boulevard. Um, how are we going to allow pedestrians to get from one half of the park to the other half? It is, I'm sorry, if you want to address no, I, This is something we've already set as a goal. Um, and we have got a couple of goals ahead of us. There's also an adjacent 22-acre piece of property that is owned by the school district that uh, we have set out in this agreement to work together towards uh, acquiring uh, and dedicating recreational use. But having pedestrian access across uh, Telegraph Road would be enormous uh, in terms of you know accessibility and use in the park by that neighborhood there, the, the kind of Kennett neighborhood, right? Yeah, so I, I did want to clarify that at least my understanding is, and correct me if I'm wrong, your eminence, <laughs> but uh, uh, the road telegraph doesn't, uh, to my knowledge, bifurcate the park itself. So the, the entirety of the park, I believe, is west of telegraph or northwest of telegraph there. And what's southeast there is actually an old landfill called the Kennett Road Landfill, at least in common parlance. And so that is not part of this agreement. Um, so the park is really just on the west side, northwest side of, of Telegraph. However, having said that, there we would like to find a way to try to make crossing Telegraph more pedestrian friendly because while there's a, a landfill on a portion of the east side of Telegraph, there's uh, also uh, a uh, of a decent-sized residential neighborhood a little further north of the landfill that, that comes into play there. And so we would love to find a way to make this park more accessible for that residential neighborhood, which would require crossing uh, Telegraph. Cool. Yeah, portion of Telegraph, I believe, is cities yes correct. it is yeah. that's right so most of telegraph is a, a state highway um and this is a relatively recent extension of telegraph that was built in the very early 2000s and so the state uh, portion of telegraph ends at dixie highway north of dixie highway was a city road uh, that was improved and installed in the early 2000s that's completely under the jurisdiction of the city so we don't need to go to to the state for any kind of approvals in terms of putting in pedestrian enhancements across Telegraph in that stretch. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Hearing none, uh, motions on the floor and support. Can we have a roll call vote, please? <laughs> oh, not the vote, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chair, you have eight yeas, zero nays. We also need a motion to receive and file the report that we got. Kristen? Motion. Supported by Marsha. Uh, can we have a roll call vote on that, please? Mm -hmm. Prompt the vote, I'm sorry. Yep, keep forgetting. That's okay. <laughs> You can tell by my age that I uh, yeah. Mr. Chair, you have eight so nice. Very good, thank you. All right, we'll move on to the next item, item C, which is Parks and Recreation Amendment 6. Thank you all so much, and, and thank you especially, Mr. Chair, in your dual role on the Parks Commission in here. So thank you all. Yeah, thanks. Great to see you. Thanks. Nice to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's cold. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, next item is uh, Parks and Recreation Amendment 6, the Oakland County 4-H Fair Association for Paving Improvement Projects at Springfield Oaks County Park. Uh, is there a motion? Moved by Hoffman, supported by Lewis. Mr. Ward. Thanks again, Mr. Chair. Um, Oakland County Parks is a long-standing partnership agreement um, uh, with the, the Fair Board uh, to operate the 4-H Fair at Springfield Oaks uh, Fairgrounds. And uh, they uh, have the ability to apply for and receive direct grant funding from the Michigan Department of uh, um, Agriculture and Rural Development. 
this uh, item here, now uh, they've received a grant from MDARD and they've also worked with a contractor to negotiate extremely favorable rates for, um, uh, it, to, to, uh, re to do a paving project uh, out there on the fairgrounds. So uh, where this intersects with us, it is county property and under the county's policies, anytime we have a donation above $10,000 in value, uh, the Board of Commissioners must give its approval and we encapsulate that within the agreement uh, with the Fair Board. So we expect this project to be a total value of about $214,000 and just need to uh, get your approval so they can uh, get the work commenced. Marcia. So um, I understand there are various different types of <coughs> concrete mm -hmm. and some are better and more recommended for the environment. More pervious. The, pervi no, the exactly more pervious, right. the better. And so I wanted to be sure that that was the type of concrete that was going to be used. It is not in this case. However, uh, there, just like many other things, there are, there is more expensive with a pervious uh, it always, pavement it's, option. It's, it's more expensive unless you amortize the expense. Correct. But there are areas where it is certainly more effective, and we've have made a decision to really focus on parking lots rather than uh, entryways. This particular entryway, you know, we did take a look at that, and our engineering folks really felt like the cost benefit scenario wasn't there to invest in that type of material here. Um, and in this case, of course, there are no county funds involved whatsoever. This is state funding matched um, by a, a, you know, a very large discount from the contractor. So we aren't in a position to demand you know, the type of material to be utilized here. But I do want to assure you that that's part of our overall plan. And we are going to be tackling some pretty major parking lot projects in the next couple of years and uh, using that type of material. If uh, first major one, we can tell folks we have a plan in the next year or two. Any other questions for Mr. Ward? Kristen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I love the 4-H Fair. As a child, we frequently visited uh, the 4-H Fair. And one of my favorite events, and I'm curious if Oakland County is going to have any representation, is going to be the Demolition Derby. Chairman, I think that we should have an Oakland County uh, car be a part of the uh, Demolition Derby or the Lazy 8 uh, races. <laughs> exactly, Penny. So I'm just throwing it out there. It's an amazing fair. Um, so if any of you have not gone, I highly encourage you to go. They have some really fun uh, events that take place. And I think, Penny, we need to get a sponsor then uh, and get a car uh, to attend. building a car years ago. <laughs> mm -hmm. So just throwing that out there, Chairman. Mm -hmm. Very good. And we will talk to the 4-H Association about that. And, uh, only if all of you agree to have your own vehicles. And, uh, <laughs> our own I will vehicle. find a vehicle. <laughs> <laughs> I, I too would uh, say that if you haven't been to the 4-H Fair, mm -hmm. Please try to go this year. It starts on the 7th of July. I think you're right. Yeah. Um, it's a good time uh, for young and old and families. Uh, a lot of great activities. And uh, it's just a, a great uh, event. And uh, uh, Elsie Cranlin, who is the chairman of the Fair Association, does a fantastic job. And I'm sure that you'll enjoy yourself that day. So. Is there any other comments, questions? Hearing none, can we have a roll or prompt the vote, please? Mm -hmm. I'll get it straight one of these times. <laughs> Mr. Chair, you have seven yeas, one nay. Very good. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next up is. A deed clerk register of deeds grant acceptance with the uh, Michigan Supreme Court State Court Administrative Office for Legal Self Help Center grant program for 2023. Is there a motion? Moved by Joliet, supported by Loops. You're here to address us. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Thank right you, ahead. Mr. Chair. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. I'm uh, Deputy County Clerk Fred Miller. 
and I'm um, pleased to be joined, bringing you greetings from on behalf of our county clerk, uh, Registrar Deeds Lisa Brown, of course. Um, Heidi Walling is our clerk supervisor. Uh, Heidi's been with the county since 1987, 88 and has forgotten more about how the courts work than I'll ever know. And she doesn't forget much. So um, we're really, we just want to never miss an opportunity to brag about the great team we have at the county clerk's office and in, you know, emblematic of all of our county workforce, uh, just incredibly dedicated people who provide great quality public service to the people of Oakland County every day. So this grant uh, is for $40,000 made possible by SCALE, the Supreme, the Supreme Court Administrative Office um, for legal help, self-help centers. Uh, we operate, if you go in the south entrance here and then you turn right to go down where the clerk and register of deeds is at, on the left-hand side is our e-services center, provides eight free access computer stations, as well as our team there that allow people to come in, do research, genealogy research, but primarily um, court research, access court explorer, um, michiganlegalhelp.org, which is a fantastic user-friendly website for people. Primarily, we see people who are in pro per, who are representing themselves, researching their cases. And our staff um, is not allowed to give legal advice and really, frankly, is too busy to, to, to do that. So this grant would allow us to partner with legal professionals to provide legal information, not legal advice, but provide legal information and kind of help these folks um, navigate their way through the legal system um, in way, print out forms. Um, there's really an, a limit to what we can do to, to help them fill out forms, but kind of push them in the right direction without going past that line. So this grant uh, would, would do that. We are partnering with, we have secured a partner in the Oakland University Paralegal Certificate Program. We're going to identify students who have the right aptitude and competence level to come in on a weekly basis and uh, to be there to, to be that resource for uh, citizens. So appreciate your support and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Are there any questions? Seeing none, can you prompt the vote, please? Sure. Mr. Chair, you have eight yeah, yeah, zero nays. Thank, Thank you, Commissioners. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Since we move the agenda around, the next group is not quite here yet, but they are on their way. So why don't we take a short uh, five, ten minute recess? Perfect timing. I need more coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Seven and a half. <laughs> Great. So who do you like in the back, Ella? Sorry, we never.
Right now, yeah. I love that about the school. You can put your we don't try. We don't try it. Guess what you know what you're scheduled to do. Exactly. I mean, I love it. You told me to ask. Yes. It was audacious. With us today is Mr. Weaver from the executive office, and he's the new diversity, equity, and inclusion officer, and he will be giving us a presentation. So I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. I'm newish. I don't know if they still let me get away with calling myself new. Uh, I started in October. Um, and get a year. I'm sorry. You get a year. I get a year. Okay. Well, then I'm I'm new. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, but what I what I do tell people, it doesn't seem new because it really wasn't like this orientation period. There was this idea that okay, you said that you can do these things. Here they are. Um, and so there wasn't a hand-holding period, or, which, I, which I'm glad of, um, which means I didn't waste two months with orientation to have to reverse all of that and, and actually get down to doing the work. Um, so, yeah, my name is Harry Weaver, uh, Chief uh, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Officer for Oakland County. Um, just a tiny bit about my background, because I don't want to spend a whole lot of time talking about me. Um, I've been doing this work. I told people I've been doing this since before it had a name. Um, I've been doing DEI work for over 20 years. Um, the bulk of it has been in the education sector. And I started it right here in Oakland County, uh, working for the local Anti-Defamation League office. Um, there, I started off as a contract trainer with their a World of Difference anti-bias programming. Um, and from there, was promoted to the director of education for the Michigan Regional Office um, and worked on a number of education initiatives. Uh, in the in the region as well as nationally uh, for law enforcement for education and a number of other uh, contexts and so from there uh, I moved on to uh, go to uh, Chippewa Valley Schools which is the seventh largest school district in the in the state where I was the uh, diversity equity and school culture consultant uh, for a few years um, and, and I came over here um, when this position to open up so um, I really do have a have a passion for education. I enjoy being on this side, though I think a bit more. Um, in education, I'm in a situation where I'm pushing up against policy that's already been created and trying to find ways to circumvent that, that uh, policy and seeing how we can best serve children. Here, I'm on the front end and can affect how policy is crafted before it becomes policy. And I think I like this side better. I think I, I think I like my effectiveness here better. And I also like not having to deal with parents. All right. <laughs> my wife is also a retired educator. Um, where does it not work? The arrow? Yeah. Okay. There you go. No, that's not me. All right. Okay, go ahead. It's making noise. <laughs> oh, here we go. Position summary. All right. So my role uh, is to build a system that operationalizes equity. Um, and that's the part I want to focus on. I don't typically like using PowerPoints um, because I don't like for people to feel like I'm reading to them. Uh, if you just wanted this information on paper, we could have given you these handouts and been done with it, right? Um, so I, I really want to touch on some key points um, that are things that may not be familiar or may be out of context. So when we talk about operationalizing equity, we talk about making it work in spaces. So in, in a lot of diversity, equity, inclusion spaces, we have these closed-door conversations, you know, these meetings once, once a month or bi-monthly, whatever, um, of these kind of shadow councils, and then no action comes from it. We're just meeting and doing workshops and having a conversation. When we talk about operationalizing equity, we talk about actually taking these, these equity ideas and applying them to what we're doing in the county. So my elevator speech, so when people ask me what I do for the county, I say, well, my job is to make sure that everything from <clears throat> aviation to the zoo and everything in between is looked at through an equity lens. And that sometimes that means, you know, race and sexual orientation, 
uh, and religion. Sometimes that means uh, physical ability. Sometimes that means making sure that people that are neurodivergent are, are accounted for. I just went to a conference uh, a couple of weeks ago where we were talking about digital accessibility and making sure that our websites and things are accessible to people who have a number of different things that they need to read a screen or have a screen read to them. So all of these different things go into when we talk about DEI work. And unfortunately, in the larger conversation, we get stuck on these ideas of race and gender and all of those things, which, and I'd be disingenuous if I did not say those are large parts, but that's not all we do uh, in DEI work. It's a much larger spectrum of uh, work. So, uh, so here again, in terms of operationalizing equity, um, just a, a, a single example, one of the things that we're looking at is auditing our job listings. We're going through these job listings and determining what of these listings actually requires someone to have a bachelor's degree. Do you actually need a bachelor's degree to start this position? Because we're locking a lot of people out, making a requirement that may not be necessary. And so as we audit these positions, and as we begin to move, remove that requirement from some of the positions, we will then be making these positions available to a wider audience. And we can have a, a, a wider selection of people from the county, hopefully, um, that are able to apply for these positions uh, and make a good wage working for the county. Um, purpose and function serve internal and external stakeholders and acknowledging systemic inequities uh, that cause disparate outcomes um, and accessible access. So. When we talk about serving internal and external stakeholders, the position um, here for the most part has started off uh, inward facing or internal, looking at some of the structures we have in place uh, inside the county and the ways that we work and how can we how we can reorganize some of those things. And to be honest, we've made some really, really big strides in the last, what's it been, I guess seven months now. Um, and that is not a, that's not a me thing, that's a we thing. Um, the executive office and, uh, and everyone there has really been kind of pulling together to make sure um, that we are making these, uh, making these pushes. One of the big things is us uh, being present to whatever degree we can, um, but kind of rotating, I guess, being present at these new higher orientations. One of the things that I uh, made a point of when I came in um, and we were having conversations about was, hey, people need to see us. This, you know, the fifth floor is seen as like this dark cabal of faceless people who pass down these policies that affect the rank and file, but no one knows who any of these people are. Nobody knows anyone's face. And so to kind of reverse that piece, we do go to the new higher orientations to introduce ourselves. Yes. It's, um, the employment application. So a few years ago, we worked on that to make it more friendly. I don't know what changes were made. It doesn't seem to be that. There's a great many changes to make it more accessible for many different people to complete. The outcome of that was uh, we removed a box regarding criminal... Yes, the activity. felony box, the, the mm -hmm. F box. Yes, yes, yep. yes, yes, yep. yes. But is that something you're able to review? Is the yeah, so that, that's something that we'll also review as, as we're auditing positions. Um, because, again, you know, we're really kind of unnecessarily gatekeeping if we're, you know, requiring someone to have a certain le level of education that just is not, you know, commensurate for the position. And so... Um, and, and the case might be, it might be a conversation of, hey, to start this job, you do not need a bachelor's degree now. If you want to advance in this department, maybe the next promotion or the promotion after that will require, a, you know, a combination of de your degree and the experience that you've gained uh, working. Um, but, you know, again, that's a conversation for the next level. Um, and, and yes, we definitely want to um, take a holistic look at it, not just the degree requirements, uh, but other requirements to make, you know, as many folks eligible as we can. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 
So yeah, so we're uh, uh, my position is is very much internal facing now, and we you know we progressed into uh, some outward facing things as well. We did a community service event uh, for MLK Day um, that really had our equity initiatives and our equity council kind of out front. Um, and I love to talk about that event because it's a day that county employees have off. And what we were able to do in our first outing in doing this, our MLK Day of Service, we had over 80 volunteers do over 400 hours of community service. And these are people who typically have this day off to do whatever they please with. And they, and they chose to spend some hours. We had we were at five different spaces throughout the county um, doing a number of different uh, charitable events. And so I'm very proud of that. And that's something that will not just be restricted to the MLK Day holiday. The idea is that we'll do this at least three times a year. Um, so we'll have a date at some point in the summer and then do, do something for Thanksgiving. And then uh, that'll be kind of our annual piece. So MLK Day a summer date and then the Thanksgiving season. All right. So the Equity Council. Uh, is anyone not familiar with the Equity Council? Okay. So our Equity Council it, it's, is a council that is made up of county employees. Um, and we have, Jen, do we have somebody from every department now? We do now. Yeah. So, um, so we, have, we have representatives from every department. Um, who are able to take what we do in the council and bring it to their individual department. So I'll say this, uh, when, I, when I came, we did not have representatives from every department. Um, and, and the design for this to function the way it's, it's supposed to ideally, we definitely want voices from everywhere. And so um, thanks to the hard work of Jen, <clears throat> excuse me, and, and Jamie Fenner uh, and, our, and the rest of our planning committee, we were able to kind of get the word out and really get uh, in spaces to have conversations with department leaders and say, hey, we really need somebody from your department to be on this equity uh, council. So during uh, so during the council meetings, right, we do these things that, that lead to creating the culture that respects diversity, uh, promote cultural sensitivity, uh, workforce diversity. So the question is, how do we do that? So oftentimes these sessions are, are educational sessions. Um, and we do, uh, the, the sessions range in terms of subject matter. Uh, we actually were able to uh, have an autistic woman who came in and talked about uh, autism in the workplace and how people who have autism can still be effective in the workplace. And not just autism, but other disabilities, um, which was incredibly interesting. Um, I did a leadership development uh, presentation at our last council meeting where we also did an Eid uh, celebration and we had, uh, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, we had one of our uh, deputies come in and talk about her Eid experience and talk about her, how her family uh, observes Eid both now and when she grew up. Um, and so, you know, things like that to bring culture into a, into a smaller space and getting an understanding um, but also getting it, the framework in terms of like training and education. So now what's happening is we get these council members going back to their departments and we're getting these individual department equity councils, which are absolutely the, the goal. We want every department to have a few voices that says, hey, we're not, are we really looking at this through an equity lens? Can we slow down for a minute and take a look at this? Or say, hey, I think we're doing a great job at, you know, looking at these things from an equity lens. Let's keep it up. So thus far, just in the last few months, we've had uh, Equalization has their own uh, equity council that just that started not too long ago. Uh, Health and Human Services and Human Resources um, all have their own departmental equity councils that are kind of offshoots of the larger council. And... Uh, model the same way. Um, and again, community engagement. So we talked about the whole community service piece, um, <laughs> advocate, champion, ambassador. So and, and so like again, these members go back to their departments and talk about the things that we talk about in the meetings. And it's also very much a space for people to come and say, hey, something is happening in my department and I'm not sure what to think of it. <laughs> I'm not sure if it's an equity matter or if it's if it's me as an individual and something's rubbing me the wrong way, it's a space. It's a space where we can have these conversations 
and like-minded people can help us come up with some solutions uh, and, some, and some potential ways to move forward. Um, equity council members have completed a total of over 1,600 hours of DEI training in 22-23. Um, we had several new members. Um, yes, DEI in-person training. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Trying to find the, remember which ones were the most important. So the MLK Day of Service we already touched on. So, but the piece before that is so important. Six equity council members successfully completed their, their certified diversity professional certification through the Michigan Diversity Council, uh, which is a, city, a subsidiary of the National Diversity Council. So when I talk about having done this work for over 20 years, when I started doing this work, there were no certifications. There, were no, there wasn't a degree you could get. You just kind of did the work. This CDP certification really pulls all of that together. And I've been through the certification as well. And I am, um, I was just baffled at how they pulled so much information together um, to put people through a one week training to do all of these things that it took me 20 years to, to kind of figure out and, 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 you know, kind of experientially uh, get a hold of through all the bumps in the road and all of that sort of thing. So it really is a, a great certification. And I'm glad that we're able to take advantage of that uh, through our membership with the Michigan Diversity Council. Um, I also sit on that board. And so uh, at the county, we have a little bit of sway and, and, can, uh, and, and can also arrange some things through them um, that some other entities might not have. Uh, in that way. Um, supported two departments in starting their own equity councils, HR equalization, uh, and we actually can add help to that. Um, and again, provide DEI training to several departments. I'm doing, um, I've been doing DEI training for uh, Children's Village. They've got a state requirement that they have X amount of uh, time spent on a DEI training. And so while we're in the middle of retaining uh, new contractors to do our uh, DEI training. I've been taking that over um, because I don't want things to languish and not get done just because we haven't put a contract in place. And while that's not how we would prefer me spending most of my time, I do love doing it uh, because at my at my very base, um, that's kind of kind of how I started and this work was doing facilitation. Um, so I've been working with Chil Children's Village for the last three months and we'll continue to do so uh, until the end of the year until we're finished with those modules that they need. All right, so operationalizing, and this is really just a quick um, kind of illustration of what I've already talked about in terms of what we mean when we talk about uh, operationalizing. So the, the key piece for me is collecting, analyzing, and addressing data uh, for actions toward equitable outcomes. So again, and, and our hiring and employment is easy to point at because those are those are always hard numbers. We can always take some very simple data and uh, give us the answers that we're looking for in terms of who we're interviewing, who we're hiring, who we're not hiring, or who we're not retaining, right? And so we can get a really good snapshot of these things kind of quickly. Another piece, though, uh, that this goes really well with uh, is in our procurement department. So we now have a very, very pointed effort in procurement to make sure that minority-owned businesses, women-owned businesses, uh, veteran-owned businesses are getting access to, fair access to bids to do work for the county. Um, and we want to make sure that we're providing any sort of uh, tools that they may need uh, in order to continue to uh, to thrive. And, and, you know, again, we want to make sure opportunity is on the ta table for everyone. Um, community trans, I'm sorry, communication, transparency, and accountability. So I have a uh, meeting that I hold with the executive team uh, every other week, uh, my equity and, and executive uh, meeting. And that is my, my mantra, communication, uh, transparency, and accountability, because I want everything on the table. I want it to be clear what initiatives I'm working on, what things I've made priority, and if we need to have a conversation about those being rearranged, we can do that. There's space for that. But I definitely always want to make sure um, that I'm very clear and, and communicating my, uh, my, my happenings uh, with the team so that we're able to all move kind of in lockstep. Um, that's the last one. 
that was the last one. All right. All right. Does anybody have any questions? Yes. For sure. Okay. Thank you. I actually have a few. Um, <clears throat> what's what's neurodivergent? I'm glad you asked. So um, when we talk about mental health, then we talk about different ways that uh, people think, right? So those of us who uh, who are considered in, in a, a standard mental space um, do not suffer from things like schizophrenia or things like um, depression or, um, or anxiety. Yeah, so all of, all of these things... Um, that, that make people's uh, minds think differently or, or made up differently. So when we talk about neuro, neurodiversity, we talk about employing people who um, may have, you know, some of these mental challenges um, and how we can support them as well. Got it. So as a Jewish white female, mm -hmm. I feel very sensitive to anti-Semitism, to chauvinism, Certainly. but there are still many, many times when I think to myself, oh, can I say that? Mm -hmm. um, how do I say that? Yeah. And I don't know that the commissioners have had a diversity training, yeah. um, which I would like to request. Absolutely. Because we are leaders, we are out in the community, and I mean, we speak at our council meetings, and there are times when I have to say, oh, I am not sure Certainly. how to say that. Certainly. So I would like to request something like that. Definitely. And even on an individual basis, if you've got those questions, feel free to reach out to me. Okay. Um, again, I've been doing this work for a long time. And when I, when I work with people or coach people in that way, one of the first things I tell them is don't waste a lot of time trying to figure out the right way to say it to me. I've been doing this work for so long. You're not going to say anything that's going to offend me. You're not. Now, when we're when we when we're done and have had the conversation, I might say to you, "Okay, don't say that to anyone else." <laughs> right, and sure. then we'll have a conversation on right on the on the correct way to phrase it. But right. in terms of speaking with me, if you just call me and say, "Hey, I'm not quite sure how to phrase this." And go on with what you have to say, and we'll work it out. Yeah, I, I well, don't thank have you. That That's something I did with Robin, and she was very, very yeah, helpful. Yeah, please, feel free um, to reach out. The, does, we don't get any feedback. We don't get any um, updates from the Diversity Council. Is mm, that okay. something you might consider? Because so all this conversation is going out amongst staff. We work with staff. Certainly. We work with lots of different staffs, and, and we don't have a clue. So yeah, I would imagine we could put a uh, we could put something in place where there's a liaison um, between the council uh, and the board of commissioners. Um, also, I'm just thrilled you're looking at the whole college uh, degree yeah. portion. I have so many extremely competent, successful friends that yeah. didn't complete college, and a lot of them have a, a lot of shame around that. Right. Right. Um, so I would love to see that looked at in our application. Um, and speaking of our application, so I've had many, many issues with our application. Uh -huh. And one of the things I'd like to just see if you might consider is some sort of, instead of giving three names as your reference, mm -hmm. is maybe the opportunity to have a phone call with someone or to have a written recommendation because so many times we've recommended people that didn't have one of the simple mm -hmm. boxes and so they're out. We right. don't know why. Right. And, and we're shocked. So being why. flexible in the way that we accept uh, references and things like that. Right. There yeah, I, I don't see why that's something that we wouldn't be able to look at as well. Again, we, the the while we talk about the degree requirement being a gatekeeper, it's not the only one. And so, you right. know, we can absolutely look at other factors that may be, you know, unnecessarily narrowing our applicant. Well, and maybe you could come to the LAGO committee with this discussion because we get the applications for so many important um, positions that we select someone for, and sometimes the questions we want are not on the application. Send so, me an invite and I'll be there. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Thank yeah, you so absolutely. much. Absolutely. Thank you. Kristen? Thank you, Chairman. Um, how many departments here in Oakland County have their own DEI officer and then as our Oakland County Chief mm -hmm. DEI officer, how do you and other departments work together to ensure consistent equity um, in the internal policies, practices and systems that you put forth it's for employees? Synergy, right? 
Yeah, so so in terms of departments, uh, the only one that I'm aware of that has its own diversity head uh, is Parks and Rec. Um, and Zach and I have a really good relationship. Uh, he just started maybe six weeks ago, um, maybe a little longer than that. But uh, when he first started, that was one of the first things that, that we were able to do is he and I got on, the, got on the call just to kind of make sure that we're on the same page um, and seeing how uh, Parks and Rec, how we can make sure we're all kind of on the county right uh, uh, ethos in terms of, of DE and I work. And so um, we've had a few conversations since then, and we're in we're in lockstep in terms of, of what we want to do. Um, other than that, um, I will be responsible for other departments. Now there are other there are municipalities within the county. Um, that had their own DEI officers. Uh, Farmington Hills comes to mind immediately um, as they just hired someone not too long ago. Um, and with that in mind, when I talk about us eventually going into more of an outward-facing role, one of the things I see my office being is a resource to the rest of the county, to other municipalities. Um, our, I think our equity council is already a model in that way. Um, and, and, you know, other entities in the county being able to come to us and say, hey, I need a counsel on this, or, you know, can you give me some ideas or some resources on this? So kind of being a, a hub um, and, again, a model for, for the rest of the county and, and for the rest of the state, for that matter. Excellent. And my last question is, is how, do, how are you measuring objective, equitable outcomes, and what kinds of data are collected along this process? Yeah, so, so it depends on what we're talking about. So, again, if we, if we uh, uh, stick with the example we're using of employment, those numbers are very raw and very hard. It's easy to see. All right. So, and, and I won't even go into hiring. I'll go into where we're getting our applications from. So we noticed that certain venues or certain uh, uh, vehicles for getting applicants uh, are getting more minority applicants than others. And so we try to figure out why. And as we figure out why, then we begin to say, okay, so what are the, some other ways that we can recruit some diverse talent. So we look at the places that we're already in. One of the things that, that has boosted our, our minority uh, application is an application called Handshake. And it basically communicates with college campuses. Um, and we've gotten, we've gotten a, a substantial boost from that. And one of the things that I've also talked about that we've not had the opportunity to um, operationalize uh, just yet, but we'll, we'll be soon. Um, the Metro Detroit area is one of the largest hubs for historically black college and university alumni in the country. And there's no reason we shouldn't be tapping into those uh, alumni, um, you know, clubs and, and, uh, and, and chapters um, to get candidates for all sorts of work, whether it be, you know, uh, Oakland County Schools right across the street from our building. So whether it's recruiting teachers or accountants or whatever it is, there's no reason to not tap that. Um, that resource and that can, you know, those are things that are borne out in the very statistics that you asked about. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Right. Well, um, first of all, thank you for coming and thank presenting you. to us and giving us a, a closer view of what you, you're doing and what you have done since you've been here, Mr. Weaver. I just want to say I'm happy to see um, Ms. Persons here uh, to be an assistant to you because yes. I think Robin was a lone wolf. Um, yeah, in a lot of ways she was. And <coughs> this work me. needs help. Mm -hmm. um, what I wanted to say was uh, I represent the uh, city of Southfield. Mm -hmm. city of Southfield has numerous Fortune 500 or companies. And even this work has been um, tapped into by the corporate community. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of like Lear, they have diversity um, and inclusion efforts. And it would really be good as you go externally to um, help galvanize those officers as well. Certainly. In our corporate community, um, you mentioned Farmington Hills, but the municipalities are looking at it. Mm -hmm. But then also in our corporate communities um, and just helping us get it, you yes. know, because we look at it like it's something to um, just lift up women and um, uh, African Americans, where really diversity is cultural, 
It's uh, mobility focused. It's, it's, it's everything you could think of, literally. Everything. Yep. And um, we just have to get to a point where we see people where they are. Mm -hmm. And this is helping us to do that. Certainly. You know, I know a couple of 80 year olds that are like 40 year olds. Yeah. <laughs> you know, older people shouldn't be thrown away yep. um, when they're trying to still fulfill accomplishments. Absolutely. Especially because it's hard to retire nowadays. Yes. Yes. Um, Speaking about college attainment, um, you know, we're focusing more on apprenticeships and not as m many higher level degrees. And I know Oakland 80 is focusing on that. So there's kind of a collision course, but still you have to speak to people where they are right now. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and so I'm happy to see that. What I wanted to ask, um, other than making that statement, was... Um, we have a behavioral health uh, component of employees here mm -hmm. that um, Melba and HR help to um, galvanize or help to uh, manage, as well as um, a former commissioner, um, and he's a Republican, and he helped reinstate this, he and I. Um, and um, I'm trying to think which one. Um, but I'll get his name in a minute. It'll okay. come to you. But just, you know, looking at that group of people, you know, friendship circle and mm -hmm. folks that wanna wanna help people with limited disability abilities yeah. as well. So all of this fits under DE &I, mm -hmm. and I'm glad that you're establishing councils um, within Oakland County to help describe everything that you're trying to do. Sir. Because um it just feels as though sometimes, you know, people look at it just like it's um, uh, racial, mm -hmm. you know, um, EEO and EEOC, those um, entities were created to address a lot of disparate um, outcomes. Certainly. But there's a journey to the outcome. Mm -hmm. And, and this is what I see you guys doing, um, coming in and educating us so we don't have those disparate outcomes. And, 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 and so thank you. Thank you. And education is a huge part of it. Mm -hmm. Because, again, if we listen to the public discourse about what DEI work is about, we really don't scratch the surface. Um, and so being in here and able to be in this room and have um, a more detailed conversation about what I do um, and what I endeavor to do moving forward is a great conversation. <coughs> Excuse me. So thank you. So thank so you. much it's just so much broader. Mm -hmm. And um, as we go down uh, with political discourse about all of this, we can't lose the fact that it accompany it it can really bring in a lot of cultures. Yes. And just you know, ages, mobility <coughs> issue. Yeah, you know? all, all of the isms. There's a I have a I have a list of about twenty isms. You know, mm, that, isms. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that I, that I use in, a, in an yeah. exercise I do about establishing common language. But it does just that. It gives us a a snapshot of how wide ranging you know our diversity and equity uh, initiative should be. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a question. Yes. First of all, I'm excited to hear that you. Uh, degrees don't mean everything when it comes to employment. Certainly. Uh, I've got a son, uh, for example. Um, he didn't want to go to college, so he doesn't have any kind of a degree. He did go to Specs Howard to learn broadcasting, but when it comes to being mechanically inclined, he can fix anything, mm -hmm. whether it be wiring, plumbing, plumbing, automotive, whatever it is. And yet, Nobody looks at that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, they look at the paper, oh yeah, this calls for a college degree. Right. Uh, you know, uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is um, uh, being chairman of Oakland County Parks, a lot of our employees, a big majority, are summer health. Certainly. And we have an awful problem every single year trying to get people to apply for those summer jobs. Mm -hmm. Um, sometimes the qualifications, uh, you know, in the, it, it's just too much. Yeah. Uh, we, we've done bonus programs to try to get people to apply, to retain those people for the following summer. Mm -hmm. And we're not the only department. All the departments around the county have summer help. So I would ask that, <laughs> that we try to work on ways to encourage part-time summer help. Yeah. It's been difficult all along, 
And uh, so I just wanted to point that out. Okay. Thank you. Are there any other questions? First. Yeah. Um, Commissioner Nelson mentioned other departments having uh, DEI officers. Didn't you say something about equalization? Equal, yes. So equalization, they don't have equalization, health, uh, and human resources. Those have their own equity councils. Councils. Yeah. Okay. As opposed to their own equity position. Okay. So commissioners are not invited into the equity council. I managed to sneak into a couple of meetings <laughs> because I was doing something and I got yes. included. But I think what you're hearing from us is that we're really interested. And yes. as representatives from, for the county, I think we need to have more regular updates. We need to be able to express ourselves as well. So I think it's an important relationship. I'd love to set something up where if, where you all can come to a, uh, an equity council meeting um, and, and just kind of talk a little bit about who you are and what you do and your interest in the work they're doing. So those meetings uh, necessarily for, for a safe space, for lack of a better term, or, or confidentiality space, are not open meetings. Um, and I get that. I, yeah. I understand that. But I, I, what I'm also saying is that I think you're hearing that we do want more of a relationship rather than a once a year update. Yeah, from that, you. That, that's that's the point that I'm getting at. So um, there are there are times during the meeting or meetings that we can set up. You know, we've got a meeting in a couple of weeks, so obviously we wouldn't be looking at that. But maybe we look at the July meeting. Um, or the August meeting and having board of commissioners come in and introduce yourselves, talk about what you do, and the council can do the same um, and kind of create that rapport. Um, like I say, we, we've created a, a space that people feel very safe and confident um, in speaking, so we'd love to have you and, and again, people be familiar with who you all are. Are there any other questions? Very good. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Weaver, for being thank, here. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Um, <coughs> motion to receive and file the PowerPoint presentation. Motion by Nelson, supported by Johnson. Any discussion? Very good. We need a roll call vote. Comfortable. <laughs> okay, with that, the next item is public comment. Is there anyone that would like to discuss any item either on or off the agenda? Yeah, I'm sorry, I was waiting for okay, that's right, it never prompted me. Okay. Seeing no public comment, uh, the meeting stands adjourned. Thank you. Welcome, man.